Hello. Unfortunately, I cannot be here this morning, so we are going to have our notes placed here on YouTube. If you wish to slow it down and pause it because we're going too fast, feel free to do so. But we're going to try to fit quite a bit in in this time. So don't feel like you have to keep the video playing for the entire thing. Pause it as you need. So yesterday we talked about the neuromuscular junction and how nerves transmit messages to muscles. Now we're going to talk about how the muscles themselves use that signal to contract. This is called the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. And this is caused by the nerves that we looked at yesterday, sending the signal and the muscle receiving it and sending the signal onward throughout the muscle cell. This causes myosin heads, which is the protein, that, one of the proteins that we talked about earlier between myosin and actin. This causes the myosin heads to attach to binding sites on those actin thin filaments. The myosin heads then bind to the next side of the thin filament and pour, pull them towards the center of the sarcomere. You can think of it as someone pulling on a rope. You grab on one end, pull it towards you, then grab the next part up, pull that towards you, grab the next part up, pull that towards you. Your muscles work very similarly to that. This continued action causes the sliding of the myosin along the actin. Just like you pulling on a rope, the two ends, yourself and the end of the rope, get closer. However, as opposed to you pulling on the rope, in this point, it would be the rope is stationary and you are being moved by it. Moving on. So it'd be like you climbing a rope, I guess. The rope doesn't move, but as you pull on the rope, that forces you to move along the rope. The result is that the muscle is shortened or contracted. So here's kind of what it looks like. A is the muscle at rest. B is after the muscle has contracted. You'll notice that the thin filaments have moved. In a relaxed muscle cell, the regulatory proteins forming the part of the actin prevent it from binding. Those purple things prevent it from binding. However, when this action potential sweeps along that sarcolemma, the calcium ions that we looked at are stored in the muscle are released. This opens up those binding sites which allows the myosin to then bind to the actin. When it's bound to the actin, we get the power stroke in which the myosin head pulls the actin and causes it to move. Here's a great video that shows you kind of what happens in a little bit more detail than what we just went into. But unfortunately, I'm trying to get it uh, recorded so that I can post it to YouTube and we can still keep on track. So I will be posting this YouTube video on uh, Google Classroom so that you can watch it uh, along with the notes or after the notes. Contraction of the muscle fiber is all or nothing. You either don't contract or that muscle cell contracts. You don't have half the cell contract. You have all that cell contract or none of that cell contract. However, within the skeletal muscle, not all muscle cells have to contract. It'd be the same as having a line of people. If I give you a rope, you either pull or you don't pull. There's no in between, but the more people pull, the stronger that contraction. The fewer people pull, the weaker that contraction. That's how you can have differing levels of contraction in your muscles. The number of muscle cells that you cause to contract, the number of those motor units that you stimulate will 
increase the strength of your muscle contraction. Along with that, within the skeletal muscle, not all fibers may be stimulated. Different combinations may give different responses, such as if you want to uh, hold a child, you're going to be very gentle. If you are holding your dog while giving him a bath, you're probably going to have the same motions, but it's going to be much stronger because this thing is fighting against you or trying to play in the water much stronger. You are going to have the same muscles reacting, but many more of those fibers so you can have a stronger reaction. The graded responses are the different degrees of shortening. It can be in response to either how often the muscle stimulated or the number of muscle cells being stimulated. The shortest, briefest one is a muscle twitch. Single, brief contraction. It's not a normal muscle function. I'm sure many of you have had muscle twitches as they just... Uh, you'll feel a weird jumping of the muscle beneath your skin. That's a muscle twitch. It's not a normal muscle contraction. You get single stimuli, and then it comes back down. Very quick reaction. From here on out, though, we need to talk about summing of contractions. One contraction is immediately followed by another. You, your muscle does not completely rest due to more frequent simulations, and the effects are added up, such as this. You get the stimuli at the first pink arrow on the left, but before it returns to a resting rate, on the right, you get another contraction. Some relaxation occurs between contractions in incomplete tetanus. Many of you probably have heard of tetanus as this disease in which your muscles freeze up and you have locked jaw. Tetanus does describe that disease, but tetanus is also a, an anatomical term for freezing of that muscle. Sometimes you want to freeze that muscle. Some relaxation occurs between contractions, but they arrive at an even faster rate than during the summing of the muscle. Unless the muscle contraction is smooth and sustained, it is said to be in unfused tetanus. So you can think of it as like when you are lifting uh, a weight that is much too heavy for you, and you can feel your arm shaking that would be incomplete tetanus because you get some relaxation in which your arm drops down as you're not supporting anymore. But then before it relaxes completely, it gets stimulated again and you lift it back up. That's what causes the shaking of the muscles as it relaxes and tightens back up, relaxes, tightens back up very, very, very quickly. Since there is some relaxation, it is incomplete tetanus because it is not a smooth and sustained contraction. It looks like this. You have small bouts of relaxation. And finally, complete tetanus. No evidence of, of relaxation before the following contractions. The frequency of stimulation does not allow for any relaxation. It's a smooth and sustained muscle contraction. So you can think of it something similar like you lift up a baby and you are holding the baby in your arms. Your arms don't get to relax, but you don't see any shaking. They just stay in that fused tetanus state. They don't move. And this is what it would look like. You don't see them moving because it is a smooth and continuous contraction. How your muscles respond to strong stimuli depends on number of fibers stimulated. The more fibers, the stronger your muscle tension can be, the stronger reaction you can get. 
They can continue to contract unless they run out of energy. Your muscles have to run out of energy before they stop contracting. Or they can also stop contracting if you turn off the nerve stimulus to them. If you decide, I'm done with this, let the muscle relax. You can also do that too. So what do we use for muscle energy? First off, muscles will use stored ATP. However, there's only about four to six seconds worth of ATP stored in your muscles. So, you are out there on the football field and coach asks you to run from one end of the field to the other. You start sprinting. After about four to six seconds, so probably around the five second mark, we'll say on average, your muscles run out of stored ATP. They've run out of their immediate provisions of energy. After that time, other pathways must be utilized to produce ATP. The easiest one is direct phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate. That sounds really, really, really complicated. To dumb it down, your muscle cells store CP, creatine phosphate. It's a high energy molecule. After ATP is depleted, adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate is left. Creatine phosphate then transfers a phosphate group to ADP to turn it back into ATP. So once you run out of that ATP, creatine phosphate will then start donating more phosphates to keep that level of ATP high. And you have a little bit longer for that. You have about 15 seconds that you could rely on that. And this is what it looks like. Pretty simple. Yeah, we'll continue on with these. Aerobic respiration. This is the main way you wanna make ATP. Take a glucose molecule, break it down into 32 ATP. There are many series of metabolic pathways. This is a slower reaction, requires continuous oxygen. It's why your muscles don't always run out of energy. As long as you're not doing strenuous work, aerobic respiration can keep up with it. And is the highest energy. This is a very dumbed down way of looking at glycolysis. And then you throw it into uh, later on the aerobic pathways. Right now, this is just like glycolysis. You've got about 40 seconds of energy for that. If you do not have... Uh, oxygen, this is the only way that you would be able to produce energy. Because it results in pyruvic acid and then lactic acid. That's a problem. The good news is you can do it without oxygen. So if you are sprinting and don't have ready supply of oxygen, you can still perform this. Glucose is broken down into the pyruvic acid to produce about two ATP. You need ATP, we break it down, but then it converts to lactic acid. Huge amounts of glucose are needed though, and lactic acid will then produce muscle fatigue, which will wear your muscles out even more. That's when your muscles start getting sore after running for a while because they're building up lactic acid. Oh, whoops. This is the way you want it to happen though. So apparently I need to flip these pictures. So this is aerobic. This is how you want it to happen. Produces 32 ATP from glucose. You go to pyruvic acid, but then if you have oxygen, you can turn that pyruvic acid into many more ATP in the mitochondria. If you do not have oxygen, 
you must convert that pyruvic acid into lactic acid. When a muscle is fatigued, it's unable to contract even with a stimulus. Even if you poke it, even if you send a signal to it, it doesn't have energy. It can't contract. Most common cause for muscle fatigue is oxygen debt. Your oxygen must be repaid to the tissue to remove the oxygen debt because it's needed to get rid of all that lactic acid. You gotta get rid of all that lactic acid and before you can start contracting in a strong way again. Increasing acidity from the lactic acid and the lack of ATP causes the muscle to end up contracting less. And finally, how they contract. You have two types, isotonic and isometric. Isotonic is myofilaments are able to slide past each other during contractions. The muscle shortens and movement occurs, such as bending a knee, rotating the elbow, your main movement. Isometric does not see movement. Tension increases, but the muscle is unable to shorten or produce movement. Think of it as attaching a rope to this school and then pulling on it with all your might. You're not moving the school, you're not moving, but your muscle tension is increasing. You can feel your muscles tighten and increase how much they're pushing, but no movement is happening. That would be an isometric contraction or the example they put here, but lean over a wall and push on that wall. You're not moving the wall, you're not moving, but the muscle uh, tension is increasing. That is where we're gonna stop for the day.